Hi. Hi, Gopal. I'm trying to figure out if you are already a host and the. Uh, Sorry, say it again, please. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out whether you're already a host. I think so because when I um when I joined it it said started the recording so when I will leave I think it will stop the recording and I will be able to um get the recording locally. I see. I see. that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, hey, how is it going? Good, good, really good. How are you? Very good. Long time. No see. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same here. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you, there is an echo. Sorry, can you say again? There was an echo, but I think it's better now. You just give me one second to see. I think it's better now. Think so? Yeah, I don't know. Zoom is Zoom is weird. No, I, I think it's it's good, good, good. Awesome. Yeah, uh, Zoom and Ubuntu are worst friends ever. It's horrible. Like, I don't know if you don't have a Mac machine or I don't know Windows. Who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true. Um, so, are you um have you come to USA yet, or are you still? Yes, yes, yes. I am in Mountain View actually. Oh. So we are in the same time zone, more or less. Like we have a time difference, I think. So yeah. now, so now here is nine a.m. Yeah. morning. So yeah. for you, is it? It's uh, twelve. Ah. So it's like New York time zone. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean. Yeah, when we were at NVIDIA, we used to have a time zone difference. <laughs> it was, it was. Um, I think whenever we talked, it was pretty late in your night. Yep, <laughs> normally 11 o'clock. So how is it going? Are you close pretty to... Good. Um, I'm, I'm trying to... Um, so I'm going to defend my thesis next month. And then I'm going to um, UBC for postdoc. Awesome, congrats, yeah. congrats. Uh, so... Yeah, congratulations to you as well. Um, Thanks. <laughs> how do you like it so far? It's fantastic. It's very, very nice. I love it here. Uh, yeah, like the weather, first of all, it was amazing. Um, the, you know, like the food and like, uh, like the fresh produce and everything here in California is super nice. Um, and it's very nice to be in a country where you can, uh, like, you speak the language very well. I mean, are confidently enough yeah. so that yeah. you can, like, you know, joke with people when you go to buy groceries and these kind of, like, you, you know, you feel comfortable talking to others. Whereas in Germany and Switzerland, it wasn't like this. And, of course, the, the lab is very, very nice. It's uh... And we are going to the office. So today, I this is my house. So I'm, I'm from home. 
<laughs> but uh, normally we go to the office, which is a very nice change. Yeah, in comparison. yeah, of course, of course. Otherwise, it's like not like brainstorming becomes really hard otherwise right yeah i mean i think it was really horrible during the quarantine that we like for two years you know yeah. at least i was working from home yeah, whereas now too. you, you too. get me people yeah. um, so are you back at in the office is like uh completely yeah, or? So we, we are i think every almost everyone comes to office um and um it's like mask mandates are also going down. Everybody's vaccinated here. Everybody got mm -hmm. the booster as well. So yep. that way is pretty safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, let's um, let's give uh, a little bit more time to people. I think they are really late. So it's a very nice, um, thanks a lot for the invitation. I was, I, I was going to say this also in the beginning of yeah. the talk, but I want to say that. Yeah, we are, we are, we are lucky to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky to be here. Um, so can you, can you try sharing screen? And yeah, share of course. Here? Let's see. Uh, I think uh, I need, uh, you need to give me access. Um. It says host the disabled participant screen setting. Okay. Uh, let me, yeah, that's a good point. I actually don't know. Can you claim host? Like, no, let's see. I have no setting. Okay, let's see. Uh, I need uh, to enter the host key to claim host role. Um, that's a good point, actually. I... OK, let me try to sign out and sign in with a different Zoom account in case this is the issue. Because normally, when I sign in, uh, uh, one second, please. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. Let's see now whether I can claim the host. Can you try sharing? Yep. Okay. No, not yet. It says host or disabled. Okay. I'm trying to figure out something. Once. Yes. Try again. 
Yes. Yes, it works now. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, we should try starting. So, hello, okay. everyone. Uh, welcome back to MLFO. <clears throat> so, today we are, we are really happy to have Despina Pascalillo. Pascalillo. Um, she's a postdoc at Stanford University working with Professor Leo Gibas at Geometric Computation Group. Prior to this, she did her PhD uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen and the Computer Vision Lab at uh, ETH Zurich under the supervision of Andreas Geiger and uh, Luke Wango. She received her uh, Diploma in Electrical and computer, uh, computer Engineering from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in 2015. Her research interests revolve around semantic and interpretable representations of 3D objects and scenes. She spent one year with Professor Sanya Fiddler at NVIDIA Research, developing interactive tools for content creation. Uh, moreover, uh, she spent six months at FAIR working with Professor Andrea Vidaldi and um, David Novotny on unsupervised 3D reconstruction from video data. Um, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Despina, for accepting this invitation, and the um, uh, stage is all yours now. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, like I'm very happy to be here. I was uh, super happy when I, I saw the uh, email inviting me. So thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, for organizing this talk. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, so uh, the, the work that uh, I will be presenting for you today was mostly done during my PhD and uh, during my time at the uh, Autonomous Vision Group and um, CV CVL and NVIDIA. And uh, yeah, like I just want to have this as a disclaimer. Okay, so uh, in general, um, what I've been trying to do during all my PhD was to address the task of uh, 3D scene understanding. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to introduce somehow compositional representations capable of capturing uh, the functional composition and spatial arrangements of objects and object parts in the scene. So I know that, um, uh, Yumas has done fantastic work on uh, these directions, so I don't think that I need to, to motivate at all why compositional representations uh, make sense. So yeah, this is, uh, I think, a very interesting and exciting uh, research direction. So uh, very briefly, what I've worked on during my PhD was uh, on compositional representations. And initially we focused on primitive based representations for recovering the 3D object geometries. And uh, we proposed uh, two architectures that seek to represent object shapes using a semantically consistent part arrangements. And um, in contrast to more powerful 3D shape representations such as occupancy networks, um, our primitives provide a more interpretable alternative that allows reasoning about um, semantic parts. Subsequently, uh, we focused on uh, uh, structural representations that uh, go beyond part level geometry and focus on higher level relationships between object parts. And in this work, we proposed a course to find approach for simultaneously representing an object with more and less details. And while in this work, um, we don't show any results on scenes with multiple objects, I strongly believe that this structure of web representation with multiple levels of granularity would have been very beneficial for 3D scenes with multiple objects, where we would need more attention to more cluttered parts of the scene and less detail to more to less sparsely populated uh, regions. And um, finally, 
uh, what we did we, uh, during my internship uh, at NVIDIA is that we proposed uh, a neural network architecture for synthesizing indoor scenes by plausibly arranging objects within the scene boundaries. For this task, um, we observed that um, our model uh, is capable of inferring semantics about objects in the scene directly from data. Uh, for example, that a nightstand is typically positioned next to a bed or like a, a, a bunch of chairs typically surround a table. And uh, we used this kind of learned semantics for generating plausible new environments. So one of the very big motivations of my PhD was uh, Pentland's paper from 1986. So this was a paper that was introduced to me by one of my first uh, colleagues when I was like a baby PhD student, Ali Osman Ulusei, when we were actually at the CVPR in Salt Lake City. And uh, I think this is a fantastic work because technically what uh, Pendulum was doing here, he suggested to represent a scene using a bunch of uh, superquadric surfaces. Superquadrics are cool because they can be, uh, they, they provide an alternative to more compact representations. So they are represented with 11 parameters. And what I love about this work is that um, he managed to reconstruct a scene using 100 primitives. And uh, even though you might see this and you'll be like, yeah, I mean, this is trivial. It actually is not because even today we are not, we don't have at least I don't know of any method that can uh, reconstruct uh, large scale scenes using uh, primitive based uh, methods. And um, uh, what I find very interesting is that, uh, at least what I find very inspirational about this work is that um, in my mind, uh, being able to have this sort of compositional representations <clears throat> can be very extremely important for a lot of tasks where we care about uh, uh, compression or other tasks where we want to have interoperable operations, uh, interchangeable primitives where we can replace one with another as we will see in a bit. So yeah, I think uh, this is, was a very, very nice work uh, done back in 1986. Okay, so uh, among the first of that uh, revisited the task of learning part-based abstractions with neural networks was Shumba Tulsiani. Uh, in, in very briefly, part-based representations seek to decompose a 3D shape into a set of semantically meaningful uh, parts. And uh, uh, what uh, Shubham proposed here, he proposed to learn cuboidal primitives directly from voxel-based representations of 3D objects using a neural network architecture that was trained in an unsupervised fashion, namely without any primitive annotations. So as you can see here, um, the final abstractions look really cool. At least I find them, I still find them very cool. But um, due to the limited representation power of cuboidal primitives, the fine details cannot be properly captured. So for example, you see that like, let's say here, we have a dog, but you cannot really say that it is a dog, but you see that there, there is some sort of a tail or here there must, these are like the two legs of the dog. <clears throat> So, inspired by Subham's work, back in 2019, uh, we proposed to employ superquadric surfaces as geometric primitives in order to allow for a larger shape vocabulary. So, the key idea here was that instead of deciding the set of specific uh, primitive voca vocabulary, uh, we were um, instead we're going to use a family of shapes to capture. Uh, the 3D geometry. And the cool thing with superquadric surfaces is that superquadric surfaces are defined in a single continuous uh, space. So uh, we didn't like I can invent something you know completely new as I told you in the beginning superquadrics have already been used uh, before as uh, geometric primitives because and actually they are a very natural choice of primitives because they can model a variety of shapes from cones to spheres and cylinders and <clears throat> And due to their diverse vocabulary, obviously they can uh, um, 
represent more details in comparison to cubes. And the nice thing is that they can be fully described just using the 11 parameters that control their shape, size, and position in 3D. And in addition to that, uh, since they have uh, more expressiveness, they, have, they can uh, represent more, more shapes. They allow for faster and smoother fitting in comparison to cuboidal primitives. So uh, our architecture is actually very simple. I'm just only saying having these figures here for completeness, but you could, in, in, in theory, you could uh, have any architecture. So here, what we used, we use a voxel-based encoder that takes as an input a voxel grid, but obviously you, could, you can replace the voxel-based encoder with an image based encoders such as a ResNet or an AlexNet or whatever. And we estimate a bunch of features. And then using these features, we have a series of regressors that regress the primitive parameters such as the size, the shape, the translation, the rotation, and an additional auxiliary variable called probability of existence that allows us to control whether a primitive is a part of the assembled object or not. So this particular variable is modeled using a Bernoulli distribution, but based on my experience, this is very difficult to train. So as we will see um, a bit later, I don't think this is the proper way to learn actually parsimonious representations and the representations that um, have like a, a representation with a variable number of primitives. Please note that our supervision only comes from um, a mesh. Technically, we take a mesh and we sample a bunch of point, a set of points uniformly on its surface. We don't have any uh, supervision in terms of the primitive parameters nor the number of parts that uh, the reconstructed object. Uh, it should be represented with. So let's very quickly have a look at how well the model works. Lena, can yes. I interrupt here? Of course, of course. Uh, Please. Thank you. Um, so you said like you're trying to do these parsimony, parsimony mm -hmm. representations of ships. So how do you define parsimony here? Like in mm -hmm. terms of number of parameters or number of primitives, their yes. complexity? Yes, very good question, actually. This is a fantastic question. So what we did here is we defined parsimony in terms of the primitive and uh, uh, the number of primitives. However, I I think like what you're asking is like uh, something that is very important and useful to think about regarding how do we really need, what do we really need um, a parsimonious representation to be? Uh, personally, I think that what we did here and what actually the entire community is doing is not, is suboptimal. Uh, and what I believe would be very interesting to think is how we can achieve parsimony how can we uh, describe parsimony in a way that allows us to achieve maximum compression of information or maximum reusability of primitives? This is uh, something that I don't think was uh, uh, was done before. But if you ask me, I think that would be the, the, the right way to go. Like technically trying to, to infer, to, to enforce parsimony by making sure that we have maximum reusability of components. So, yeah. And by the way, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, yeah, like, I, I don't mind, uh, you know, continuing from where I was left. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> but yeah, this is a very nice point. And actually, yeah, maybe we uh, I'll revisit uh, this uh, by the end of the talk. Okay, so yeah, as I was saying before, uh, we can see here that superquadric surfaces uh, lead to more accurate reconstructions. Of course, if you compare these reconstructions to more powerful shape uh, representations such as occupancy networks, these will look very simple to you. But um, the, the truth is that um, what we wanted to show here was that uh, using a family of shapes and not imposing any constraints on the primitives that a network on the shape on the uh, shapes that a primitive can use uh, can be very beneficial and can allow the network to train faster and of course capture more fine details. So one important observation here and one important thing to remember is that we associate every primitive with a specific color, namely the same uh, primitive is uh, colored with uh, is illustrated with the same color and you can see that there exists some some sort of a semantic coherence. So for example, the body, of the, the 
the, the upper body of the animals is typically reconstructed with uh, pink, uh, or like the main body of the airplane is reconstructed again with pink. So one very important thing to observe here, at least I find it very interesting, is that, for example, here for the case of a cat, where a cat is a smaller animal than uh, uh, the dog and a deer, you see that the pink primitive doesn't even exist. And instead, what used to be the leg, the I'm sorry, the neck of the animal is is now the upper body of uh, this animal. So please keep this observation in mind because I think this is a really important observation for what we can do next. So where we can move forward from uh, what we have up to now. Okay, and uh, yeah, like, <clears throat> So I think the nice thing about uh, this work, the work that we did in 2019, is that uh, it inspired a lot of works to try to improve the reconstruction uh, quality by proposing more powerful shape representation. So here are some, there are more, of course, but I will very briefly uh, um, refer to the work of uh, Bayon Denk back in CVPR 2020, where they proposed to, to utilize convex solids as shape elements in order to further improve the reconstruction quality. However, in order to be able to achieve more um, accurate uh, uh, reconstructions, uh, you have to, you know, you have to increase the number of primitives. So the way that they are able to increase the representation power of uh, of their representation is by increasing the number of parts. However, you can see this here, like these are reconstruction with 50 primitives. Uh, I think this is again with 50 primitives or more, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, no, actually this is with less. But the point is that uh, Increasing the number of parts always comes at the expense of semanticness. Uh, by semanticness, I mean that technically a primitive does not correspond to a semantic part anymore. So you can also see this here in this visualization. So here we show um, a prediction using 50 convexes. And without a doubt, the reconstruction is very accurate. However, it is impossible to identify whether, like for example, this part corresponds to a human part or an airplane part. So to address this, we introduced neural parts. Neural parts is a representation that is not limited to a specific family of shapes. And as a result, can capture complex geometries using a small number of uh, meaningful components. And you can see here that, um, it can uh, uh, capture uh, arbitrarily complex geometries such as legs or uh, upper uh, human bodies or hands or like uh, the main bodies of the airplane. So our key idea was that a primitive should be an arbitrarily complex genus zero shape with well-defined implicit an explicit representation. Uh, to achieve this, we define each primitive as the formation of a sphere parameterized as homeomorphic mapping. And um, this allows us to get an explicit mesh representation as well as an implicit occupancy representation for its primitive using the forward and inverse mapping of the invertible neural network. So you might um, see this architecture and uh, think that it is very similar with uh, the Atlas Net paper back from CVPR 2018. And actually, it, it is quite similar. The main difference is that instead of representing the homeomorphism using an MLP, we decide to use an invertible neural network. And uh, I think this is a very good thing to do because it allows us to define both the implicit and the explicit representation of its primitive. So uh, the input to our model is an image uh, of the object to be reconstructed. And during training, we assume supervision uh, in terms of a watertight mesh of the target object that is parameterized as a set of occupancy pairs and a set of uh, surface samples on the target uh, point. So technically, we uh, get the bounding box of the target object and we sample points inside its volume, and we assign every point with a label indicating whether this point is inside or outside the target mesh. Similarly, uh, for the case of the surface samples, we sample uniform a set of points on the surface of the target mesh. Um, our network architecture is 
technically consists of two main components. The feature extractor predicts a global feature representation for the input and concatenates it with a set of learnable embeddings, one for each primitive. And we use a conditional invertible neural network that allows us to, to deform a sphere into n primitives and vice versa. Please note here that if we weren't using this per primitive embedding, it would be possible to have a single INN for learning all m deformations. So <clears throat> instead, we would have to use uh, m invertible neural networks, and this obviously would have been suboptimal and would uh, take a lot of uh, time to train. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I think uh, the coolest thing about this paper, and in particular about the idea of using an INN uh, to parameterize a homeomorphic mapping between two shapes, is that we can efficiently compute the implicit and explicit representation of its primitive. The implicit representation of the predicted shape is simply the union of all primitive implicit functions, namely, one, uh, namely a point is inside uh, the predicted shape if it is inside at least one of uh, the predicted primitives. So here you can see that that point is outside of this pinkish um, primitive and outside of the green primitive, but it is inside this movish um, primitive. So in order to decide whether uh, a point uh, is inside or outside, it simply suffices to check whether it is internal to a sphere with radius r using the inverse homeomorphic mapping. And this is really important because uh, we cannot have the implicit representation of an arbitrary complex shape, but instead we can have we know the implicit and explicit representation of a sphere. So uh, similarly, in order to compute the explicit representation of the predicted shape, we need to do sample uh, points on the surface of its primitive. This can be shown here. And um, uh, then in order to discuss the points that are internal between two primitives, we can uh, simply use the implicit representation that we defined before and discard them. Technically, we find which of these points are internal to one primitive or another primitive, and we remove it. Um, this is really nice, and as we will see uh, in a bit, it allows us to impose various constraints, such as having non-overlapping primitives, and it actually improves a lot of training. And this is something that is not that you cannot do uh, using an MLP uh, because uh, the MLP does not have the inverse mapping that we use here to define the implicit representation of um, a primitive. Okay, so how do we train this entire thing? Uh, during training, we seek to enforce that the surface of the target and the predicted object will match, as well as that the orientation of the normals of the predicted and the target shape is consistent. Uh, moreover, we utilize an occupancy loss that ensures that uh, the free and the occupied space of the predicted and the target shape coincide. And in addition to that, we have a loss that prevents overlapping primitives and an auxiliary loss that prevents degenerate primitive arrangements. So in the supplementary material of our paper, you can see like the impact of every one of these uh, components. So just let me uh, make some criticism for our work here. I think that um, it would be very nice to not have to use the coverage loss. So for me, I think it's um, uh, problematic that we have to use uh, the, cover loss, uh, the coverage loss to prevent uh, degenerate primitive arrangements. For example, primitives that are very small, that capture like um, very small regions of the object or that are completely outside. So this is uh, food for thought. I think it would be very nice to, to have uh, a training objective that automatically enforce not having this kind of primitives. So how will... Um, uh, does our met method work? Let's have a look at some results. So. Uh, Something that uh, <laughs> it wasn't, I think, very appreciated by the reviewers, but for me, I think it's one of the most important uh, 
uh, takeaway messages from our work is that uh, neural parts decouple the reconstruction quality from the number of primitives as they achieve um, more or less similar performance regardless of the number of parts. So here you can see with a varying number of parts, the achieved IUU and chamfer Elman distance. And you see that regardless of the number of parts, the performance is more or less the same. And the reason why I, really, I was very happy when uh, we saw this result is that because it allows us technically to select the appropriate abstraction level based on our application without having to compromise abstraction to improve reconstruction. And uh, for me, this is uh, very, very important. And uh, you can also see this in the qualitative comparison here, where you see that um, using as little as two primitives for reconstructing the object geometry, neural parts are able to capture the fine details, whereas, for example, less powerful convex uh, solids uh, fail to capture details such as the leg of the human. And um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's important to, to uh, at least for me, it was very nice to, to see that uh, regardless of the number of primitives you add to the representation, the, the performance and the reconstruction accuracy remains more or less uh, the same, which is obviously not the case for the number of, uh, for the number of primitives for the case of CVXNet and uh, CIF and SDNs, etc. Okay, uh, here we show that the neural parts can uh, be used to, to uh, capture arbitrarily complex geometries, such as the heads of various animals, while uh, preserving their semantic identity. I would like once again to draw your attention to something that I mentioned before. So you see that um, the network is, uses the green primitive for representing the neck of the animal. However, for the case of the elephant, that is a bigger animal, you see that the neck primitive is used for representing the head of the animal. So what this uh, tells us, at least what uh, this observation um, tell me, is that actually, we are not I'm not really sure, I'm not really convinced whether primitive-based methods uh, really learn semantic abstractions. My feeling is that uh, what these methods do is that they distribute primitives on uh, the space, and they just learn spatially consistent abstractions. And I think this is a major uh, limitation of uh, all the works that uh, try to tackle the primitive based learning, because technically you don't have, the, since we all uh, optimize primitive based learning through geometry, we don't have any guarantee that the semantic parts will be meaningful or semantically coherent. So. Hey, please keep this in mind for the discussion that we will have in the end of uh, the talk. Okay, and uh, yeah, so here I have uh, also some results from ShapeNet. What we see here is that um, neural parts result in more accurate reconstructions than CVXNet with five primitives. Actually, when we use uh, convex five convex solids, it appears that uh, they cannot even um, capture all parts of the objects, which makes perfect sense because they cannot uh, generate non-convex um, uh, parts or like, you know, a solid is, is very simple. So it can, it has like a limited uh, representation capacity. And however, when we increase the number of primitives to 25, results are really great. Uh, you can say that the reconstruction quality improves a lot. However, I think that this comes at the cost of uh, interpretability since like there is no clear distinction of uh, like, you know, a, a part, a specific part that is used for representing uh, the wings of the airplane or the wheels of the car. And yeah, I think that uh, for me, this is uh, kind of an limitation. Okay, um, so I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I think I would like to interrupt here. So, um, yes. so going from your super quadrix work to neural parts work, mm -hmm. you gained a lot in terms of um, reconstruction quality. Uh, that is mainly because networks allow you to do uh, arbitrary deformation, but it also seems like you lost interpretability mm -hmm. because super quadrix uh, are parameterized and you can edit them. Whereas like these neural neural parts may be hard to edit. 
So what, what do you think about these trade-offs between how you represent primitives? I actually think you can have more uh, editability with neural parts. And the reason is that uh, technically here, the idea is that uh, for the case of superquadrix, what we did is that, that uh, a superquadrix was uh, parameterized by f by 11 parameters. What we do here is that we technically parameterize a primitive with an invertible neural network. So, you know, if you move around the latent space of the neural network, so if you change the parameters, so if you do interpolation, uh, on uh, the you, using the invertible neural network, you will see that uh, uh, there are, uh, the network has a lot more interpretability and has managed to learn uh, more more expressive primitives. So, with respect to interpretability that you mentioned before, actually this was one of the concerns. This was one of the major concerns. Uh, uh, during the review process of neural parts. So some, some uh, reviewers were saying that, you know what, uh, this is not really a primitive. This is very complex to be a primitives. Primitives should be uh, more simple shapes, such as cubes, ellipsoids, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I don't know. I personally think that this is more like of a philosophical question uh, because for me, it's a matter of what you want to do. It's a matter of uh, what is the problem that you're trying to solve. So. For neural parts, I think that what we propose is a method that allows you to have accurate reconstructions while being able to have a small number of parts that somehow, when you as a human see them, you're able to say that, okay, yes, this is a leg of a human. This is the hand of a human. Whereas, for example, for the case of convex CVX net or like uh, NSDs, it's impossible to, to say this, to, to see a part and say, okay, yes, this is a human part. And actually to be fair, for the case of neural star domain, th this is not such a profound problem. Actually, I think NSDs and neural parts are technically kind of to uh, solve a similar problem. Right, and right. The, uh, but but uh, in particular for the case of CVXNet, uh, I think you cannot really tell, uh, you know, by seeing a part to which part of the object does it correspond right. to. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But like, as mm -hmm. you said, like, what, is, what you want to do with these primitives matter. So once you have found all these primitives, mm -hmm. let's say if somebody wants to edit, then, or like, you know, enlarge a part of the body or something like that then editing super quadrics or primitives like that that are already parameterized could be more intuitive in comparison to editing these neural parts. Uh, I yeah. think that's what I wanted to say. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I definitely see your point and I think, uh, you know, it makes sense. And actually, if you ask me, there are some tasks that I wouldn't use neural parts for. I would probably use uh, uh, super quadrics because uh, without a doubt having like some, I mean, you can train superquadrics like very fast. You can like represent a scene with let's say 500 superquadrics very quickly. Like you know, uh, a sub CG scene or a 3D front, a 3D front scene. It, you can easily do it. You cannot do these kind of things with neural parts. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, for I think me, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes sense. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, just one like uh, final remark here. I think that um, you know what I don't like about uh, CVXNet is uh, that they manage to improve a lot of their construction quality by increasing the number of primitives in their representation. So if you take cuboids the work of Subham Tulsiani and increase the number of parts, you will get much better representations. If you care, if you take the method of uh, dual SDF from uh, North Navalis group, where they use spheres to represent as primitives, you will get very good reconstruction uh, accuracies. So uh, the, the thing is that technically what I'm trying to say is that um, increasing the number of primitives was one way to achieve a reconstruct high accurate reconstruction. Here, the, this is an alternative that allows you to get accurate reconstructions by, you know, uh, 
by using a, le a smaller number of parts. And, yeah, uh, and just to be fair, I think that uh, <laughs> personally, I'm not sure that uh, using primitives to represent the 3D geometry is, uh, you know, the killer application that we should be using them for. I think there are other tasks such as editing, um, shape manipulation, uh, and these kind of things that where primitives are way more suitable. Yeah, makes sense. Here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I don't have much time. So I'll skip this part and I'll just directly move to this paper because I think this is uh, more recent and more related. So, yeah, like uh, technically, uh, as I said before, what we want to do. Uh, since like I started like my PhD journey was we wanted to improve the 3D scene understanding and uh, to, to be able to show uh, to showcase how well uh, someone understands something it simply suffices to see whether they can uh, reproduce it and uh, try to generate it from scratch so uh, I think that uh, our work on uh, generating a complex 3D environment, it's also an important step towards a 3D scene understanding. And um, what we did in this work is that we created a generative model that can um, populate a room given only it, uh, its layout. We can use the exact same uh, mod, uh, method to populate a partially complete room or even uh, make um, object suggestions uh, conditioned on uh, uh, a, a condition on the scene uh, that we need to populate and um, I think that um, what is important to mention here is that this work technically allows for more interactive capabilities uh, for indoor uh, syn synthesis. So why did none of this was not uh, possible before? Actually, it kind of was, but uh, let me uh, briefly uh, mention uh, uh, these two works, the fast scenes by uh, Ritchie et al. and Sinformer by Wank et al. So both works are very similar in the sense that both uh, represent the uh, scenes as a collection of objects. However, they impose a natural constraints on the scene generation process uh, because they assume there exists an ordering in uh, the way that the scene is generated. Technically, they represent um, scenes as ordered sequences of objects. And um, uh, these uh, naturally impose some constraints that we try to address. And uh, what we do is that um, we proposed here the first model to perform scene synthesis as an autoregressive set generation task. So uh, let me try to uh, first explain uh, how we do this, and then we can uh, uh, briefly, uh, I can try to convince you that this is important. So uh, the input to our model is a collection of scenes. So each scene is um, uh, co consists of an unordered set of objects and its floor layout that is parameterized as the top-down orthographic projection of its floor. And here objects are represented with colored uh, bounding boxes. So here. Every color box corresponds to an object in the scene. Each object uh, is, is technically represented as a 3D label bounding box. And um, we model each box uh, using four random variables that describe their category, size, orientation, and location. And during uh, the generation process, the object attributes are predicted autoregressively, namely uh, one after like, first the class, then condition on the class, the translation, then condition on the class and the translation, the rotation, and condition on the class, translation and rotation, the size of the object. Autoregressively predicting the object attributes is a logical choice since we want our model to consider the class of an object before reasoning about its size and location. And in our setup, as I said before, we the order with which we predict um, the parts is class first, followed by translation, then rotation, 
and finally size. So to compute uh, the likelihood of generating a scene as an unordered set of objects, we need to accumulate the likelihoods of generating each object with any possible ordering. So in order to mathematically formulate it, we introduce a permutation function that computes the set of permutations of all objects in the scene. However, training our generative model to maximize this likelihood does not ensure that all orderings of objects will have equally high probabilities. This is a crucial problem since we want to be able to complete any partial set of objects in a plausible way. And moreover, this summation here is intractable uh, because it goes over all permutation. And if you have a long sequence, this number can be infinitely high. So instead of maximizing the likelihood of generating a scene with any possible ordering, we try to maximize the likelihood of generating a scene with all possible orderings. And uh, how can we do that? Very simply, we replace the summation with a product over all permutation of objects. Training our generative model to maximize the log likelihood of generating a scene with all possible orderings is now possible since we can simply approximate um, the summation over all permutations using Monte Carlo sampling. And um, I, the, if, if we want to go over the network architecture, we can see that uh, starting from a scene that, as I mentioned before, is parameterized you, uh, with a floor layout and a bunch of existing uh, objects in a scene, uh, we pass the top-down orthographic projection of the floor to the layout encoder and extract a global feature representation. And then we have a, a structure encoder that maps the attributes of the current object into a per object context embedding. Uh, subsequently, the transformer encoder takes the context embeddings, the floor shape feature representation and a learnable object query vector and predicts the output feature Q hat of the next object to be added in the scene. Uh, using the output feature Q hat, the attribute extractor autoregressively predicts uh, the next object to be added in the scene. And once a new object is generated, it is appended to the objects already in the scene and is used in the next step of the generation process. Uh, this is continued until the end symbol is uh, generated. Uh, how do we train at this? At this is trained using uh, standard teacher forcing. So we start with the scene and we apply uh, random permutations on its M objects. And then what we do is that we randomly <clears throat> Uh, select the first key objects and using their object attributes, we compute the context embedding C of the existing objects in the scene. In this example, T is three. Conditioned on the context embedding C and the floor feature representation F, at this predicts the attribute distributions of the next object to be added in the scene. And uh, our loss is uh, simply a negative log likelihood loss between the attributes of the generated object and the next object from the permuted sequence, which in this case is the green uh, rectangle. And uh, this uh, uh, pipeline is very similar to teacher forcing. So let's now have a look at uh, how well our model works. So uh, this is a generative model. So first of all, we evaluate the performance of our model on generating plausible object configurations for various room types, conditioned on different floor plans. And starting from an empty floor plan, we generate various scenes. And here we show random samples, uh, conditioned on bedrooms, uh, living rooms. And uh, what we see is that the generated scenes are consistently valid and contain relatively diverse object arrangements with multiple objects. So one thing that I forgot to mention is that we train at this using the 3D front and 3D future data set. And uh, yeah, I think this is uh, probably the, the largest data set for indoor scenes that provides supervision in terms of 3D labeled bounding boxes. And what I think is very cool is that they constantly try to improve uh, their data set. So yeah, if you look for a data set like that, it might be worth checking it out.
Okay, so in comparison to previous works such as Fast Sims and Simformer that uh, uh, pose uh, the sim generation task as an autoregressive uh, problem, our model uh, generates more realistic object configurations that preserve the functional properties of all objects in the scene. And instead, previous uh, generative models sometimes tend to generate invalid rooms. So for the case of fast scenes, uh, note that uh, the authors in the original paper, they do post-processing. So they take the generated scenes and they uh, have some post-processing in order to fix uh, the rooms that they generate. So for fair comparison, we don't use this kind of post-processing here. And this is also the reason why you can see that there are rooms that are outside um, the room boundaries, such as here, or we have objects that overlap with one another. So this is also the case for Simformer. So to be honest, uh, in all our experiments, uh, Simformer wasn't working very well in particular for the case of living rooms and dining rooms the results were much worse than in the paper so yeah my assumption is that the model is very complex and this is why it has uh, a hard time figuring out what is going on and uh, yeah like we observe that uh, uh, also quantitatively um, our model is better in terms of uh, the FID score, as well as in terms of the classification accuracy. Technically, what we do is that we train a classifier um, that uh, tries to dis discriminate whether um, a scene is uh, from the test set or rendered using at ease, simple and fasting. And we observe that um, it is consistently, uh, our model is consistently better. Uh, let me just, say something that I forgot to mention here. For the case of, F of FID computation, the way that we compute FID is by projecting the scene in 2D and we compute the FID in the 2D domain. So uh, maybe uh, one remark here is that I really believe that um, the quantitative metrics that we have for evaluating uh, uh, synthesis are suboptimal. And we put a lot of thought in coming up with uh, a metric that we could potentially use to address this, uh, this issue, but we weren't able to find any. However, I think it's really impo important to, to try to think how should the generated scenes be evaluated? Because like, you know, we have a lot of components. We have the component that predicts the bounding box and then there is the retrieval component and we just do all the evaluations in 2D whereas the networks actually predict stuff in 3D. So yeah, I think this is probably a limitation of our work and in general, I think that we need to rethink in case of uh, scene generation. Uh, one result that I was super happy when we managed to, to get is uh, that our model is able to generate uh, plausible layouts conditioned on floor plans with uncommon shapes. So actually, these are some shapes that I uh, draw them on my own, and I gave them as an input to the network, and the network uh, had to generate uh, plausible objects. And I, I, Honestly, I wasn't expecting it to work that well, but it actually seems that the network has managed to learn to respect the room boundaries. So you see that uh, not uh, that objects are always positioned inside the room boundaries. And also the, the orientation of the objects seems very nice. I mean, yeah, I don't know about this wardrobe that is positioned in the middle of the room, but still there is enough space for the room of human to, to move around. So yeah, I think this is a, a nice observation. Okay, so another important uh, observation, another important application actually of uh, of our task is that it can plausibly populate partial scenes. So conditioned on scenes that look like this, we can um, um, complete, complete them uh, with a diverse, with many different ways. And uh, uh, what is important to mention here is that uh, Fast synth and synformer cannot perform general synth completion since they assume that scenes are generated as ordered sequences of objects. So, in particular, 
the most frequent object is generated first, followed by less common object. As a result, if we start from a partial scene with less common objects, both models either fail to add any object in the scene, or uh, in the case of scene former, they generate non-realistic object configurations. So since both models who were trained with ordered sequences of objects, they can only generate objects in the order that they were trained with. Uh, this is also the case for the variant of our model that is trained with uh, ordered sequences of objects, here denoted as ours plus order. And what we do here is that we incorporate the order information to the input by utilizing a positional embedding and a fixed ordering based on the object frequency similar to fast sync. And um, the takeaway message from uh, this experiment is uh, that considering scenes as unordered sets of objects allows completing scenes with any kind of objects. So uh, next, uh, here you can see another uh, use case of our approach where our model is able to provide object suggestions given a scene in user specified location. So, for this task, a user specifies a region of acceptable positions to place an object marked as uh, the red box. And uh, uh, the network suggests a meaningful object to be placed within the user specified uh, location. Uh, so to perform this task, what we do is that we compute the likelihood of an object conditioned on an arbitrary scene. And we observe that the suggestions that our model makes are consistently meaningful. So notably, even when the user provides something that doesn't make sense, like here, what object would you place in this region? Region, the network suggests to place nothing, and I think this is uh, very nice. And note that due to the ordering assumption, neither fast former, uh, I'm sorry, fast scenes nor scene former can perform this task. And um, another interesting use case. Uh, of interactive tools for scene synthesis is, um, uh, you know, uh, failure cases correction. So starting from a scene that looks like this, that obviously has uh, is problematic. Our model is able to identify the problematic object marked in green. So please note that the network is not aware of uh, what is uh, the problematic object. It it inferits on its own by computing the likelihood of that particular object being positioned at that particular location. And as soon as the network identifies a problematic object, it repositions it in a more natural position by sampling its uh, size, rotation, and um, location. Okay, so uh, since our method is uh, very simple in comparison to both fast scene and scene former, uh, we can uh, generate scenes uh, significantly faster than both. And uh, the reason uh, for this is that, first of all, uh, fast scenes requires a rendering after adding every object in the scene. And in addition to that, scene former consists of uh, four uh, transformer encoders, whereas our model consists of one. And as a result, it requires at least four times uh, more time for rendering um, a scene in comparison to ours. Uh, all these numbers are uh, computed on an NVIDIA uh, TI, uh, GTX 1080 Ti. And uh, yeah, uh, because I'm running out of time, let me briefly conclude. Uh, so, so far I have presented like um, models that are able to learn expressive shape abstractions in a supervised um, manner using either uh, super quadric surfaces or neural parts. And uh, I think that the important, uh, the most important takeaway message from neural parts is uh, that um, it allows us to, uh, you know, uh, decouple the reconstruction accuracy from the number of primitives. And uh, we didn't have time to talk for this project, but uh, I just want to mention like uh, two things here. So uh, the, uh, at least the way that I look at the future uh, from based on this work is, first of all, I think that it is important to uh, rethink the way that we learn primitives. Uh, uh, because uh, if you remember, Remember the images that I showed you from the cat and uh, the elephant? Uh, it seems that uh, uh, it seems to me that we are not really learning semantic 
parts, more or less spatially consistent parts. And uh, I think that it is very interesting to, to reconsider the optimization of objectives that we use for learning these uh, semantic components. And uh, for the case of the synthesis pipeline, uh, what I think is uh, very important is that this is the first work that um, poses the sin generation as an unordered set uh, uh, generation problem. And uh, because our model has fewer parameters, it's simpler to train and it runs eight times faster. And uh, one, uh, you know, some of the limitations that at least I see for, for uh, this work is that um, right now the, the the module that is responsible for replacing the bounding boxes with uh, uh, the actual objects is completely independent from the rest of the network. As a result, we have no control on uh, the meshes or on the actual object meshes that will be used to replace the bounding boxes that the network predicts. I think that it would be very interesting to consider how we can do this a bit more advanced and uh, technically also consider stylistic information of parts. This is of, uh, I'm sorry, of objects. And um, more importantly, uh, how can we have uh, uh, like, uh, is it maybe possible to really have a model that does, doesn't require image retrieval and yet can yield these nice visualizations as we can see here? I think this is a, a really exciting uh, direction for future research. And yeah, I think I'm running out of time, so maybe I should summarize. And yeah, thank you all for your attention. Sorry for uh, you know, taking more time than I should. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Despina, it was a great talk. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and we can have a few more questions uh, from audience. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, can Just you elaborate, elaborate a bit on uh, object correction? Uh, I think I, I, I didn't understand how exactly yes. the model uh, mm -hmm. did do it. Of course, happy to. Okay, so what we did here is that we, uh, you know, um, uh, on purposefully like uh, create these problematic scenes, and uh, what we do is we give we comp we compute the likelihood of uh, an object being positioned at a specific location, conditioned on the rest of the scene, and. Uh, objects that have low likelihood are identified as problematic objects because obviously and i think this is uh, this is very very nice and yeah um, then as soon as you have identified a problematic object you can resample its location size etc so this is how it is that i see i got it and you got some certain threshold right um, yes exactly 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 i don't remember the threshold exactly but i think you can see it on the code actually it's but it's very simple right it, it it's very impressive that it works consistently yes um, yes yes and the threshold <laughs> was basically defined once right like for every yes scene. oh exactly. nice nice yeah okay exactly. thank you thank you thank you exactly i'm sorry i don't remember the threshold but i'm sure it's like uh on the scripts on the code <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe I can ask uh, last question here. So, like these uh, these objects that you're creating are are in some ways influenced by geometry. Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering. Yeah. Uh, yes. Like unfortunately, only by geometry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think um, th there is a lot of uh, things to be said about consistency of the. Mm -hmm. Of the you know drawing room or uh, consistency of the bedroom yes. in terms of texture style. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It, like and it, it seems like it, you can get a lot from giving a perceptual yeah. feedback. Yes. Right. Okay, so actually, uh, I, I'm working with a student on extending this work to consider also stylistic information. Uh, your observation is great, exactly. So actually, I don't think that I have results here, but uh, yeah, like when we were working on this project, uh, it was very annoying because sometimes it was it was generating completely, um, you know, bad scenes. Where, for example, you had like a, a white bed with one black and one 
white nightstand. And it was so annoying for me because, you know, we humans can see this and say, no, this is wrong. Because no one, I, I think no one would do it. So uh, to answer your question, I think style is very important. We are trying to do this right now. Um, the results are seem to be very, very good. And uh, yeah, I think the most important question to try to answer here is what is the right distribution that we can use to represent style? And uh, because, you know, like you can do very simple things such as, so first of all, the 3D from data set uh, gives a style annotation for all objects. So there exist like all objects have like a style information such as minimalist, simple, Chinese, Korean, whatever. So obviously the simplest thing to do is to do like, uh, to represent style as a categorical distribution and to try to learn it in a similar manner as as class labels. This works very well, it was expected. Uh, there are other things that you can do. So I can tell you very briefly what we've done. So we've tried like uh, uh, representing style using a Gaussian mixture model. This also seems to be working very well, but I don't really like it. I think this is not the right way to go. And we are really trying to figure out better ways to really learn this stylistic information in yeah. order to get like, as you said, stylistically consistent um, yeah. part of it. I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how to do it myself, but like it seems perceptual uh, loss. Mm -hmm. is yes. Something, something. Because like, you know, you go, you go to Google and you can just search like bedrooms and you get an infinite amount of data there. And mm -hmm. you've got to be somehow able to use the GANs <laughs> along with NERV. <laughs> To, yeah. to somehow, you know, <laughs> alchemy to generate data. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It might actually, this is something that we are discussing. Yeah, yeah. And we are discussing with a student that is working on that. So he's actually a master's student from uh, Greece that is trying to tackle this problem. And uh, yeah, like uh, guns is definitely something that um, we considered gun with a name <laughs> might be tricky. But yeah, uh, it might be interesting, I don't know. But I think, uh, it, I mean, you you have scenes from your data set, so yes. you can, then it should be at least, I think the data set is probably not large enough, so, but you can use NERF kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. GANs could also improve the performance data, I guess. Do you know what's the issue? The issue is that I personally think I, I really like what the direction that you're suggesting. The problem is that uh, without a doubt, the results that we will get without the retrieval won't be as fancy as the rooms that you see here. So we might be able like to have these uh, to generate scenes without having any retrieval pipeline but uh, people will be like no but your scenes are not as nice as for example when you do the retrieval which makes sense so i'm just wondering is there a way to get like this kind of quality that you can get using like a retrieval without having to do retrieval i don't know i i, I yeah. think this is yeah we're, we're working on this hopefully we will have something <laughs> oh cool um yeah i think uh, uh we are running out of time and uh, yeah. there will be a few one-on-one -on -one sessions later um so thank you despana for yeah feel free to your questions yeah and yeah. feel free to contact me if somebody wants to discuss more or whatever i'm always happy to chat yeah okay thank you okay bye. thank you so much bye <laughs>